Demon fans, and welcome back to the Demon Land podcast. My name is Andy, and after the Demons legally claimed ownership of Optus Stadium in 2021, they have been forced to foreclose on the venue as a result of our second consecutive loss at that ground this year. These two losses have been our first defeats at the holy site since our drought-breaking premiership. Joining me tonight to dissect another devastating loss to a team from the West this season is veteran Demonlander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Welcome back from New York. Um, they rejected me from doing jury duty in the last couple of weeks, but they said to me, uh, you're a Melbourne supporter. Um, you won't be doing anything in September, so I've been signed up to go back there in September. <laughs> yeah, well... Uh... No, you uh, clear your diaries, uh, <laughs> folks, or, 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 or not clear your diaries. Uh, start filling them up in September because uh, well, we'll see what B-Man has to say about that. So also joining us is that guy to give us that some hope that our 2024 season isn't a complete bust, B-Man. Good evening, B-Man. Good evening, Andy. Welcome back um, from States. Interesting time to be in America well done. You got rid of uh, a president. Bad luck. You couldn't have um, done something for our win loss columns. So. <laughs> well, I did. I, my my record while I was away was uh, two from two, and I got uh, yeah. back. I got back <laughs> Friday, and I said to George before by Sunday, I wish I had been back uh, there. So. Um, yeah. yeah, good evening, George. Good evening, Demon Landers. Yeah, very uh, uh, tough day in the West. Disappointing game, wasn't it? Really disappointing game. But the season's far from over. I mean, question I asked a few weeks ago is just like forgetting the the sort of emotion of another tough loss uh, and not you know not wanting to paint myself into a corner as the eternal optimist is <laughs> you know is anyone seriously writing the blues off they just got touched up two weeks ago by the dogs is anyone seriously writing the cats off they just got touched up down at their uh, home ground uh, equally as badly as we did by um the dogs again you know no like i haven't you know objectively, if you take the emotion out of it, no one is saying Carlton because they got flogged. I know that they're second on the ladder and they've got a more impressive record than us, but it's not a compellingly better record than us. Um, but no one on the ba basis of getting that touch up uh, when you're away, Andy, is saying, no, nah, no, nah, Blues can't win it anymore. So, or they're not, a, you know, they're not contenders. So, you know, it's incredibly even this is this season of footy, you know, I think the volatility of the results, um, I might uh, ask Willow to have a look at it, but I suspect in terms of the scoring differential and the win losses, um, between teams is one of the the more extreme in 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 a long time in terms of the sort of volatility of you know of um, the favourites winning for instance or not that we were favourites in this game which is good contest. Oh, no, don't be man. I, I can't see us winning another game this year, and I don't. Uh, I don't care about the results of the other teams and what they're doing. We we just look miles off it, um, and even the wins that we had while I was away. And I did see them, but, um, I d you know, who do we beat? West Coast. We beat Essendon, the great pretenders. Um, well, Essendon were second on the ladder when we beat them. So, like, I mean, it's a, of course <laughs> we can create any narrative to, to to say we haven't got a chance, but who have stripping Essendon that away. Who have they beaten this we, year? No, Essendon. Uh, well, but that's yeah, like the, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, you could you could play that game all day. Who are Frio beaten? <laughs> yeah, well, Us twice. Us twice. Well, you've just said that we're no good. <laughs> we're just, yeah. no, you've just said we're no good, so we you can't no count good. us as okay. twice, can you? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. So who have Port beaten? Well, they're no good either. There's there's no well, good. They're team. above us, they're all <laughs> and we beat them. <laughs> I'd worry if you're watching Port Adelaide games, big man. <laughs> well, it's a like it's going to be this season. As I said, this is uh, I, you know, I'm increasingly of the mind of the of you know, like I've been talking about for a long time. But the um, the preparation, there's going to it's going to be a very small window uh, of time. And I, you know, I wouldn't be to, like the, the Swans, for instance, are clearly the standout team. But as I wrote on Demonland during the week, one of the key defining features of their season so far is their incredible run with injuries. Um, and, you know, it, it is making a big difference. And if they lose two or three of the players that, you know, McInerney looks like he's out. Is it McInerney? Not the, um, not McInerney. One of their players, they've lost a couple of players on the weekend. If, you know, they'll come back to the pack 
uh, and we were, you know, we're up with, without, in this game, without our two best players. So, um, you know, there's a lot, still a lot to, to play out this season and, um, you know, I'd be shocked if we don't make finals, put it that way. All right, prepare for a shock. Um, <laughs> so each week I put the call out to our loyal listeners to help us out by leaving us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts. We absolutely love the feedback and we do reward our loyal listeners who take that time to provide these five-star reviews by giving them a shout-out on the show. And Penny Dropper writes, uh, next best thing to an inside briefing Honestly, you guys know more about the MFC team than anyone in the media and anyone else who doesn't work inside the club. As much as I love the club, I love dissecting games and learning why one team ends up with more points on the board after 100 minutes and your show feels that appetite to overflowing. Thanks to all of you for all of the time you put into researching, re-watching games, trawling Demonland for nuggets, analysing stats, editing and everything else. Well, thank you for that fantastic review, Penny Dropper. Full disclosure, we don't uh, purport uh, to know more about the ins and outs of the demons than anyone else. Uh, we're, we're just three bo- blokes yapping about the Ds, and that's why uh, we like to get questions and comments in from our audience because this podcast, in essence, is just an extension of demonland.com, which uh, you know was a forum that was created for all demon voices to be heard. So keep that feedback coming, and we will give you a shout-out on the show. If you follow us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter and you want to leave us feedback, post a comment or a question for the show, post under our uh, podcast post each week or just slide into our DMs. As I always say, we won't read out your full name on the show. In addition to being available on Apple, Android, Spotify, SoundCloud and or your any preferred podcasting app, uh, the Demonland podcast is available to be watched and listened to on YouTube. Just search for Demonland podcast to find our channel. And if you want to chat with other Demon fans, you've never been to our forum, head on over to demonland.com, sign up and you can chat with other Demon fans from across Australia and around the world. Uh, it's completely free. And in addition to being able to post questions and comments for the show, as we've got uh, every week, uh, there's also a plethora of topics and threads discussing all things demons related. So join up, join in on the conversation. It's a great place to vent after a loss. And boy, is there a lot of venting going on at the moment. You'll probably hear some tonight. If you would like to join us on the air to talk about any of these topics or just to vent, uh, then uh, please give us a call on 0390163666. That's nine, uh, 0390163666. I'll answer, I'll put you on mute and bring you on when there is a break in our conversation. During the week, give that number a call, leave us a message, we'll play it on the show. We've got a couple lined up for tonight. Uh, if you are listening live, join us in the chat room, head on over to demonland.com slash podcast. We're live every Monday, so if you want to listen to the show live, head on over to demonland.com on Monday nights at our new earlier time of 7.30 p.m. Let's get into the match overview. Uh, Demons faced a daunting challenge at Optus Stadium on Sunday, suffering a demoralising 50-point defeat to the Fremantle Dockers. The final margin underscored a match where Melbourne's lack of a Ruckman uh, and, uh, well, I guess subsequently we that uh, caused the overall midfield dominance of Fremantle, and that was clearly evident. And from the outset, Frio's Ruck duo of Sean Darcy and former Demon Luke Jackson exploited Melbourne's Ruck void winning the hitouts in the first quarter 10 to 1 and this dominance translated into a clearance count of 14 to 0 in favor in Fremantle's favor setting up numerous scoring opportunities for them and by the end of the quarter Fremantle has established a 21 point lead and the D's had failed to register a goal and the second term saw Melbourne briefly claw back into the contest with goals from Caleb Windsor and two from Jacob Van Royen however Fremantle's midfield continued to dictate play highlighted by Andy Brayshaw's Tireless work, amassing 41 disposal by game's end. And despite some missed opportunities, Fremantle extended their lead to 30 points at half time. And Fremantle, they began the third quarter with a flurry of goals, effectively uh, ending any hope of a D's comeback and the Dockers' ability to transition the ball swiftly and the relentless pressure saw the margin swell to a game high 53 points. Although the D's managed to reduce the deficit slightly with three late goals, however, the quarter ended with Fremantle firmly in control, leading by 36 points. Final quarter saw Fremantle consolidate their dominance, kicking the first four goals to put the game beyond doubt. And Melbourne managed a few consolation goals, but uh, the Dockers' relentless pressure and superior ball movement ensured they finished strong, closing out a comprehensive 50-point victory. Jacob Van Royen stood out as one of Melbourne's best players, working tirelessly in the ruck and forward line. And finishing with two goals, Stephen May was resilient in defence while Judd McVeigh and Trent Rivers tried hard in a beaten midfield. Jack Billings uh, came on as a sub, made an immediate impact with 18 disposals and a goal. 
Melbourne coach Simon Goodwin acknowledged the team's struggles, particularly in the midfield, saying our midfield's ability to win the ball and defend contest areas needs to improvement. We've got six days to prepare for the Giants and we need to get our contest game back quickly. And the Demons, of course, must re- regroup with haste as they face the GWS Giants next week with finals aspirations hanging in the balance, addressing their midfield and ruck deficiencies will be crucial. Um, well, B-Man, uh, we'll go, I won't get any of the general comments. Let's move on. But so B-Man, before you do a deep dive into your stats, we've, we've once again had a comment from a Demonland poster, the Pearl, who, who you think is George. <laughs> and once again, um, he has B-Man and his stats files in the crosshairs. Uh, the Pearl writes... No stats files this week, please. If B-Man asserts that Nibbler is one of our best in terms of the player ratings or has X number of pressure acts, I'm going to be violently sick. If you need to rely on stats, you are not watching the game. If you want to talk stats, tell me about fumbles, short steps before the contest and preferring to tackle rather than having a crack at possessing the ball. I think that's all he had to say. Is there anything else? No. So once again, B-Man, you've got the right of reply and then you can delve into your stats. Well, about 40, half an hour ago, I uh, was alerted to the fact that tonight's show was on at 7.30, <laughs> not um, 8.30. So the Pearl will be very happy. No stats file tonight. No, no, only joking. The Pearl. <laughs> but what I didn't have is a pithy response to the to the Pearl already ready to go. I thought oh, I'll think of that at like 20 past eight when <laughs> 7.30 came along. So Maybe uh, just week. a query though, like a semantic thing, um, Pearl. Uh, just a, if you want me to tell you about fumbles and what were the other categories you uh, wanted me to tell t- you? Fumble. Oh, well, let's go back one sec. Got one page back. Uh, short steps uh, before the contest and preferring to tackle rather than having a crack at possessing the ball. Uh, and so, how do I do that without some statistical <laughs> like references? Do I say I think I saw them take some short steps? <laughs> you know, kick the ball longer. I don't know what 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 how do I like the fumbles? I could give clangers for that one. That's that's easy. We could we could look into clangers. Look, as I said, you know, just to sort of I just defend myself. The pearl is the uh, you know I, I find actually I watch the game. I never would look at the stats. Just uh, you know, only a little bit during the game, and I you know. Good luck for you to be able to just do it all vibes based, but it really, really helps me understand the um, of what I've just watched uh, and um, and try to get a sort of context of what happened. And this game is a really good example of it because it it helped me sort of get a good sense of how we lost it and where we lost right. it. Um, and it's interesting because you, you mentioned player ratings and um, the the Pearl mentions player ratings and Andy in the top and he's. Outro gave a pump up to JVR and I thought to myself, right, yeah, I actually didn't think he played that well. And that's the, you know, I guess that's an example of the vibe-based um, thing. So I had a quick look um, um, after Andy spoke at the player ratings for this game <clears throat> and, uh, the, it, you know, the, you could start here about why we lost in terms of using the, st- the st- stats to give a sense of why we lost in a very basic way. They were awesome, I thought. They, I... Probably guilty of underestimating Frio, although I've been pumping him up for the last two or th- three years. I really rate Longmuir. Um, their system was, I thought, was really terrific, but they blew us off the park. They played brilliantly. They ran us off the park. Um, and that's reflected uh, in the um, player rating vote. So the player rating, as I've talked about before, is each individual act is, um, I think I'm right in saying, is um, there's a score of um, six or negative six. And and uh, and it's it's... Highly valued the player rating because it's an, it's a measure of impact. So no one really looks at disposals anymore. They're not of not of any great value. It's about impact and what you do with disposals, um, impact in what you do with your interventions in the game. So every intervention, not just every kick, is scored, and that's where they come up with the rating. Anything over twenty is considered an elite game of footy. So I mentioned last week that Cozzy had twenty three um, rating points last week, which was a magnificent performance by Cos last week. Um, so any game over 20 is uh, is considered an elite game of footy. In this game, the top 10 rated players, um, seven were uh, Frio players. Number one was Sarong, who just carved us up all match with a player rating of 21.9. 
Andy Brayshaw was 21.5. And, and again, I'd, you know, I don't know this off the top of my head, but I would think there would be very few games of football where one team has a player um, uh, scoring over 20 points in a game of 40 uh, on the player rating. Number three was Sean Darcy. Um, and this might surprise some. For all the Harry Petty knockers, he was our highest rating player by a country mile, 17.6 uh, on his player rating. His predicted rating, which is a measure that um, Wheelow, I'm reading it off Wheelow's stats, but these are champion data uh, numbers, <coughs> is um, was 5.7 for this match based on history and his form. And um, so his uh, player rating was phenomenal. And you wouldn't guess that just by the vibes best, or maybe you would, but, um, uh, you know, he had 15 disposals. 100% um, percent disposal efficiency. He was on the ground for 84% of the time. So he actually had a terrific game, Harry Petty, our best player. Um, the next was Hayden Young. Jay Gromira was next. Jordan Clark was next. Um, and and then we have to go all the way down to Trent Rivers for our next best player, who was only 13.8, and Jakey Melksham was um, number 12. So the, what is it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, of the top 10, only two were D's fans, uh, D's players, D's fans, two, uh, and none of them young players. So, you know, I think that was really revealing. If you go the other way, speaking of... Um, um, of Jacob Van Ruin's um, performance, the bottom three rated players in this match were all demons and, as it turns out, all young players. The Colt had negative two-player rating. Jacob Van Ruin only had 0.6, so his predicted rating was seven. I really pumped up last week on the the, um, solo pod how many of our younger players rated above their predictive rating and that leadership. Well, it was completely the opposite this week and it'll come out in the pressure numbers as well. So uh, Jacob Van Ruin predicted rating after a great game last week um, was 7, he 0.6, and Daniel Turner, his predicted uh, rating was 5.8 and could only imagine, only could, could only manage one point. Um, so Rui really didn't have a great game. Time on ground, 75%, 12 kicks, but he only went at 64.7 disposal efficiencies for his disposal um, inside 50s too. So n- and not a great game, but, um, you know, just looking at those numbers, they deserve, you know, oh, it goes without saying they deserve to win, but they were phenomenal um, and they really got to work and ran us off our legs and um, were, I thought, you know, incredibly impressive performance from them. Um, and, you know, like... No, we shouldn't discount how well they played when we're thinking about this game. Um, Looking at the uh, stats files, last week I talked about the rise of the hybrid and this game was really interesting, especially compared to last week because it felt like we played a very similar model. Um, And so we, again, looked to play very similar ways to we did to Essendon. I noted last week that Essendon and um, uh, Frio have a a lot of similarities in the way they like to play, and particularly their uncontested um, possessions and uncontested disposals and the the way they like to transition the ball with hands and and spread the ground. we, it seemed like in many ways we went into this game with a very similar tactical approach, which was a really high halfback um, press. Again, Jones was commentating this week and I actually really enjoyed the commentary well, from a tactical perspective of him and Burgoyne this week. I thought they gave a good description of that, though. You know, there's a, an issue that I'll flag in a sec, but... Um, defence, I thought we really, really got opened up um, in, you know, obviously in that first quarter. I flagged last week that I had a concern with um, the Bombers, the the ease at which they got some of those goals out of the back and um, last week and that uh, we really exposed ourselves with that high press. We were lucky last week to um, to only, you know, to go in, um, what was it, one point of difference at quarter time. Well, we weren't lucky this time and the same issue... Um, you know, raised its head today, uh, sorry, uh, in yesterday's game. Um, so I thought our defence, you know, to be fair to the defence, they're under incredible pressure. But having that, they they just looked structurally all over the, the um, shop and couldn't get back on defence to set up behind the ball. Jones talked about the way that we historically always have that keeper and they use May in the second half. Well, we didn't have that in the first half. Could have got, could he gone earlier to having that? I don't know. Um, but, you know, that that's, was... I guess, sort of evidence that we were struggling with our defence when they went back to that model with May um, back. But we, you know, we just couldn't cover their defence. They really opened us up and it exposed some of, you know, the challenges of that I flagged last week of, of defending a transition turnover game really exposes the de- defences. And, you know, I mentioned Port, Port, Port are, um, a good example, um, Brisbane are a good example, Pies a good example of high 
turnover transition teams that struggle defensively and one of the big um, struggles is getting back. Um, I thought one of the big differences in this game was their leg speed was just phenomenal and, and really hurt us. I thought we really struggled um, in terms of how, how good they were at covering the ground. Um, so, you know, it was a another score over 100 points. They've, um, you know, I think that's, Andy, is it what's, five this season so very unusual after only giving up three in four years um and you know they definitely deserved uh you know they could have easily beaten us by more as such was the game although i have to say i thought we stuck to the task pretty well uh intercepts in terms of so uh, the defense it was the uh first category um the score uh they they did well obviously to uh, get the score that they did but i thought our defense was probably at its worst game all season in some respects um though again you know it's a, maybe that's being a bit tough on them given the ease at which the ball was being moved in i just saw a couple of things I didn't like either and one of which was Lever he ended up in that last quarter he ended up sort of caught between two players and it was the goal I think I forget who it was one of the uh, small forwards kicked the goal where it was clear if he left that player the player was going to um, the ball was going to get tic-tacked over his head and that's what he did he allowed it and it, that I don't see that very often where he almost said well no one's going to cover my player behind or I think it was Walters uh, and he went to the player with the ball when he had never had a chance of getting to the player with the ball um, but it, it was a bit like well I'm not going to get be the one who Walter kicks a goal on me I didn't I didn't like that I thought Lever didn't have a great game uh, at all uh, really um in the marks in, as intercepts, not too bad actually. Last week it was uh, eighty-seven to eighty-nine, and um, intercept marks we were plus two. This week we had eight more intercepts than them, so um, that was all right. Intercept marks we um, fifteen to sixteen, so we were plus two last week and one down this week. Surprised me a little bit um, that we did okay on intercept marks uh, because we were woeful on turnover um, and we didn't generate much from those intercept marks or those uh, intercepts. Marks inside 50 last week, we took eight, they took 13. This week we took 13, uh, but they took 21 and um, the predominantly they, they were the easy marks they got when they beat us on the break and had free players inside 50, but that's a lot of marks to give up inside 50, indicative of how effective they were on the um, transition. Um, contested possession, a lot of talk about contested possession. Um, shout out again to Willow. He was quoted uh, in an article, it's on Demon Land, but ABC you look at abc um news uh i forget that it's cody i forget the two authors but um abc does a really good series of um uh, articles about uh, analytics uh, and this week the discussion was on contested possession using willow's uh, data that uh, exploring what it was and i thought actually it was worthwhile in these numbers to to remind people or to tell people what contested possessions are because it, it's sort of a bit confusing in some respects. Contested possession, the definition, I forget the exact definition, but champion data, to paraphrase, it's when the ball is in dispute, when neither team have the ball and the ball's in dispute. It's not actually physically winning it, you know, the ball every time. So it's made up of um, hard ball get is a contested possession or loose ball get, when again, when the ball's in dispute. Contested mark, contested knock on, a free four, um, they're all um, types of possessions. And again, as I said last week, sometimes possessions get confused with disposals. Disposals are kicks and handballs. Last week, we had a phenomenal amount of contested possessions, 142 to win that count, to that by seven. This week, as Goody was, um, he looked aghast in that presser, I have to say, just watched it before. Uh, 105 only we had this week to 142 the previous week. They had 141. We were down 36 for um, contested possessions, which is a complete and utter um, nightmare for us for a, for a footy team that bases its model on contest. You know, you could argue that's where we lost the game right there. Uh, and, you know, speaking about what the Pearl talked about, the Pearl talked about, well, we weren't, you know, fighting hard enough. Well, that's where you see it in the contested um, numbers. Post-clearance um, contested number were really interesting. We Hardball get down three, loose ball get up three, um, down three for contested marks. Uh, and they had, this was a funny stat, but, well, you know, in terms of contested possessions, they had five more free kicks post-clearance than us, which hurt seven to 12. This one was a really interesting one and is, you know, the pre-clearance goes to their domination that Andy noted um, up at the top of the show. Um, one of the pre-clearance um, numbers is gather from hit out. 
Um, so these are, again, contested possessions. So all the different types of um, ways of getting a possession when the ball's in dispute. I gather from a hit out, we had zero. They had 16. They were plus 16 for gather from a hit out in pre-clearance, and that's before obviously before um, the ball, um, before a stoppage. Uh, and you know, that's, that says a lot, really. Ruck hard ball get was uh, plus five for Frio and um, loose ball get, they were plus four as well. I thought this was t- really telling. Inside our forward 50, they had six more hard ball gets than us inside um, our forward 50. It really, our pressure inside 50 dropped off, which when I get to the pressure numbers was curious because Cozzy had a um, one of his highest pressure ratings for the season. But, uh, um, you know, I thought Frida was not great inside 50. I thought uh, generally our pressure was poor. I thought um, Disco Turner and JVR, as I noted from their ratings, were both average and both average inside 50. Um, we only could take one contested mark inside 50. Um, we couldn't gather from a hit out. They did that three times and they got two more free kicks for us. So they had 18 more contested possessions inside our forward 50, which is, uh, and six more loose ball gets. So you know, that really tells a big tale. They wanted the ball more. Uh, and when the ball hit the ground inside our 50, we, you know, we just weren't very good at getting it back or winning it back. So um, really poor from that perspective. The pressure, was it really interesting because it was almost very similar to last week. The um, overall um, rating was 177. Remember, 188 is considered average. They were only 161. Um, so we were plus 16 for pressure talked about this last week about Essendon's style and it was similar with um, uh, Docker's style. When they spread the ball, by definition, you're going to get less physical contests so your pressure numbers are all going to be down. But we were plus 20 in the first quarter, 168 to 148. That's a big differential, particularly, um, you know, in the way that they sort of dominated that quarter. But, uh, you know, the effort was there. The second quarter really dropped off 149 to 148. I really like this. So as much as Andy's right and that they got on their bike in the third quarter, I thought we, you know, really worked hard in the second half um, and I wouldn't want that to be lost in the disappointment of of the game. So um, 195, our pressure rating was in the third quarter. It went, got over 200 for a big chunk of that quarter um, to their 159. So we were plus 36 for pressure in that quarter um, and 171 to 161 plus 16 in the last quarter. So I, I thought that was... Um, impressive uh, effort from the Ds in that second half um, to stick at it uh, and to keep applying pressure. It does raise that. It's a really interesting thing how that outside run um, means lower pressure ratings. Uh, Last week I talked about this, how pumping up the young players last week and the leadership they showed and it was reflected in the um, pressure stats. Last week the top five were Riv, Trent Rivers, Andy Menez, Wakefield, Nibbler was the only senior player in the top five, Colt, uh, sorry, was Colt and then Harrison Petty. This week, barely a young player in sight. Well, Kate Chandler, I guess, Cozzy. So they number one was Cozzy. Kate Chandler was number two. Then Nibbler, Sparrow and Clayton Oliver. Um, Windsor was ninth this week um, after, I think, being seventh or sixth last week. Uh, Riv was uh, Rivers was eighth this week after topping it last week. And AMW, who was second last week, really fell away um, and was 13th for most pressure. And, I, you know, it really goes to, I think, the challenge of having a team with so many young players in it. You know, the, the challenge for getting those both for the ind- individual players but also for the high-performance team, getting young players being able to back up um, consistency of performance is, the, you know, is one of the key markers of having good senior depth. Uh, and, we're you know, we've got such a young players, a, a young group, it's a big ask for them to um, back up uh, week after week and that, that that's definitely a challenge. I talked about this last week. There's been a real upswing in our ground ball gets. So we were, you know, the outlier minus 10 after our buy against the Ruse, but then we're plus 11 against the Lions, plus 20 against the Eagles, and plus 15 last week against the Bombers for a ground ball gets. We reverted back to um, uh, this. We only won 84 ground ball gets. Again, I think we weren't, you know, running as hard as they, they spread brilliantly, I thought, but uh, we were down four for um, ground ball gets in this game. Um as I noted last week, it's a real it used to be a real key indicator for us, and it looked like we were getting back on track. This was um, probably reflective of of our lack of sort of you know a, ability to cover them and to get across and and do the things that we did it well against Essendon. Uh, we weren't able to do that in terms of stopping their ability to move the ball so quick, but they were getting to those ground ball gets, and we weren't. Um, so tackles inside 50, last week we laid 56 tackles in total, 10 inside 50. So this week the numbers weren't too bad. 
which again goes to I think our effort was all right. So uh, tackles, we laid 50 tackles this week and we had 14 tackles inside 50. So, you know, that that's interesting in terms of how that doesn't marry up with the um, contested possession numbers inside our 50. So here we get to the clearance numbers. So um, against uh, the Dons last week, we were plus three for just raw total clearances, plus nine for stoppage clearances. <laughs> it was... Um, not the case in this game. So for centre clearances, we, just in raw numbers, we were down nine, so eight to 17, um, and we were down 22 for stoppage clearances, eight to 30. And I don't know this, but I'm if I went back, I'm, I would be pretty confident that's the biggest differential we've had this season. And I suspect it'd be one of the biggest differentials in Goodwin's, uh, Simon Goody, in Goody's career at the Ds in terms of stoppage, uh, losing that many stoppages, um, 30 to eight. It's really interesting, you know, that definitely, that was discussed a few weeks ago, definitely it gives them an advantage in territory, but they didn't really get a huge advantage in scoring. I think I'll come to it in a sec. But, uh, you know, it wasn't a complete mauling from scores from clearances. Last week, Jones talked about bringing an extra to the stoppage and I was sort of trying to, as a way, and also bring the high half forwards to the stoppage to create congestion around the um, stoppage to, to mitigate the the impact of not having a ruck. Um, and that was very effective last week as indicated by the, the numbers of only, you know, we were plus nine for stoppage clearances. He said that we did the same thing this week um, and uh, in the second half, but I just saw a post on Demon Land uh, um, uh, that noted and had screenshots that we didn't actually do it very well in the first half or if we did, we weren't following instructions and that it wasn't till the second half that we actually used that tactic that we used so effectively last week against the Dons of pressing up and bringing the high half forwards to the contest, you know, to make it difficult for Frio, just like we did to the Bombers, to chain it out from those contests. That really was the game. They, they got it out from that contest so easily and then once they got out into the open space just like the bombers were trying to do uh, they really cut us up just like the bombers did when they got it out to space so you know that was definitely a tactical fail by goody if they didn't do this you know what they worked last week if they didn't start doing that to the um, second half of the game um, that was a real struggle for us they had 38 more hitouts. We ha- only had nine hitouts to 47. It's like you're not going to – that's a shellacking in anyone's in anyone's um, definition. We had a bagel of hitouts to advantage. So we had zero hitouts to advantage and they had 17. Um, and so in some respects it's amazing they didn't towel us up more on the scoreboard from um, clearances, but just the raw numbers look very ugly. And, uh, again, as was discussed last week, one of the major benefits of all of, of – of winning so much of those clearances is the territory and they smashed us in territory forward half uh, inside forward half inside 50 um, time in forward half contested marks wasn't too bad given their um, two big tools um, eight to 11 down three um, this was really the where the game was when I lost a transition from the back half you know my theory of this game is that we're trying to implement this hybrid method this new way of, of playing for goody and for this team that more turnover game, more transition. Well, we came up against a team who have been doing this for three years and they completely schooled us, schooled us in this model um, and showed the challenge that we've got. Um, uh, Daniel Hoyne, no, not Daniel Hoyne, on the S- ESPN footy podcast, they uh, looked at Melbourne this week and they discussed that Melbourne are bottom four for scores from transition from back half and bottom four for defending um points from um, or scores from the opposition back half. So those two together, you know, make it very challenging um, to be one of the best teams in the AFL at the moment. Um, Swans are number one in that category and Frio are number two in that category. Um, We're at the opposite end of the table and I think it really highlights the challenge that we've got in in implementing this new method. Uh, In the Dons game, we scored 24 points from the back half season average we're averaging 32.3 um we gave up 32 points so a flag last week that um and our season average was 29.7 it's jumped up considerably <laughs> excuse me, my flag last week that that would be real concern to goody and subsequently heard that data around being top bottom four which didn't surprise me in this game we could only manage 27 points from the back half our season average is 32 but we gave up 64 points from our back half against a season average of 31.6 so over double our season average um and that just really for me 
that just described the game perfectly. Um, we just could not stop them moving the ball from the back half. Uh, a big part of that was that I think our defensive system really broke down and we will not getting across to cover. We, I said in the pod last week, it was critical that we get across and cover um, on the switch and make sure that they couldn't just play on and it was like re, it was like a repeat of the Alice game. Is like We just let them do it in the Alice and we let them do it in this game. Um, so scores from turnover. Uh, so the, the other scoring, we actually scored two goals, one from kicking this week, which was interesting. So we only scored uh, 27 points um, from our back half, but 13 of which were from a kick out, which I thought was kind of curious. Um, our season average for scores from turnover is 49, uh, so 48.9, I should say. They scored 85 points. A plus 44 differential is Frio's equal season high um, against any team for um, the differential from scores from turnover. So equal season high, unfortunately for the Demons, is the um, other one that where they scored 44 points was our game in the Alice. So they murdered us from scores from turnover. Uh, and so we can talk about the scores from stoppages, uh, you know, all we like, but really the game was lost there. But scores from stoppages, uh, so we're only, only one point difference from centre bounces, and if you'd ask people again, the Pearl, I'd say, well, if you, you know, how how impactful Pearl were um, Frio in the centre bounce, and the AI, oh, they killed us. Well, they only scored six points. We scored one more point from centre bounces than they did. So, again, it's not about the raw numbers; it's about the impact. But as I said before, they got territory with those clearances and stoppages around the ground. They were um, um, a twenty-one to. Uh, sorry, that, uh, sorry, what am I saying? That was the bombers. So they from stoppages around the ground was 1-6 to um, uh, 23. So 17 plus 17 for scores from stoppages around the ground. They were minus two uh, for centre bounces. So we scored 1-6. Uh, we were minus two, I should say. One goal, six, and they scored one goal, two, eight. So we almost um, matched them for centre bounce. Um, it was around the ground stoppages, but still, so n- minus 19 for that game. Um, if you just looked at the raw numbers, which they kept on talking about in the um, coverage, just the raw numbers of um, uh, of clearances, they smashed us, but could only get a 19-point differential from that. So the main benefit they got was, of course, territory. And, they, they, you know, that's a big factor because when they did turn the ball over, when we turned the ball over, I should say, it turned over in really dangerous places because they won that territory battle. So I'm not discounting how important it was for this game about their ruck dominance, but I, I think it's interesting that they could only turn that ruck dominance um, and that complete smashing on the raw numbers into a plus 19 from scores from stoppages, centre bounces and round the ground stoppages. But really, the game was lost um, on turnover. Eighty-five points, thirteen goals, seven, eighty points. Well, forty-four point differential is you know that is, well, that's not going to get it done come finals. So that that's a real concern for the um, for the D's. Just finally, fitness again, as I touched on it, I think there's a real challenge. Um, a real challenge with uh, having a young group and keeping them up every week. And so, you know, I think it's not a shock that we, um, you know, we struggle in some of the, some of those um, young players struggle coming up, up, up against, uh, up at, sort of coming back from last week. And so let's see how we go this week. I, I really hope we get a bounce this week and it might be that we're going to have to put up with um, that waxing and waning of, of ability for those young players to play week in, week out footy. Um, hopefully we get Maxi back on board next week. All right. Thank you, B-Man. And uh, I just want to um, uh, another thank you to B-Man for, for stepping in, stepping up to the plate over the last uh, two weeks while I was away. Um, B man, thank you very much. Really appreciate that, and um, I'm really happy. No worries, and a good thing I got into my um, ode to Goody <laughs> last week because I may not have been able to get it in again. And <laughs> a an, correction, an so thanks. I think it's what's an eleven to correct is that uh, I blame totally take full responsibility. I should never have got a work experience student to come in and do my work <laughs> for me. But <laughs> is that I said that there were 14 players who had won more than um, 100 who had coached more than 150 games had won a flag and a better than 50% winning ratio. It was pointed out on Demon Land that it's actually 32, one of which was Checker, Hughes and Bomber Thompson. So um, uh, I blame AI for that as well. <laughs> hasn't uh, the praise of Goody hasn't aged well. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, as I just wrote on Demon Land, is that I wasn't talking about the victory over the Bombers. I was okay. talking about his seven years of senior coach of, of the Melbourne Football Club. Um, I'm also happy to have a decent microphone <laughs> back up. I had nothing with me um, and trying to record audio in a uh, in a bathroom <laughs> effectively <laughs> uh, didn't go well. So, uh, But thank you, B-Man, for stepping up to the plate so we could uh, at least uh, put something out there. Uh, for the last two weeks. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, let's get into our uh, listener questions. Uh, Magnus says, hi, gents. Uh, what does Frio know that the other teams haven't figured out? Uh, for example, why do we play so badly against them? Uh, Sam6172 says, hi, guys. What is it specifically that has turned Fremantle into our kryptonite? Seems to get the better of us uh, over the last few years. Coaching, personnel, plan, or are they just too good? As a WA-based D's fan, I'm very keen for us to get a comfortable win against them. I will, however, happily admit their supporters are much better than the Eagles. A much more pleasant game day experience. The Taciturn Demon says, how can it happen twice? How do you publicly say throughout the week we lost in every facet of the game last time, but contest uh, was the worst part, and then get obliterated in the contest? Sweeper Northy says, the same problems we encountered when playing Frio in the Northern Territory resurfaced yesterday. When at their best, the Dockers midfield is dynamic. It also runs de- deep. Whilst we might uh, not like to admit it, Brayshaw, Sarong, Young, Fife, O'Meara, plus Jackson and Darcy are superior to our current midfield group. Yes, Gorn and Petrarca will make a big difference when fit and Clary uh, with a full pre-season under his belt should result in a much better output in 2025. But at the moment, our midfield doesn't stack up with the best in the league. Reviewing our engine room over the off-season and adding to our mix will be critical. That also means considering how we replace Rivers at half-back to allow him to become a permanent mid. I like the fact that we've been linked to Isaac Cummings, GWS and Dan Houston, uh, Port Adelaide to address that important need. And if we can add to our midfield depth, we can also return A and B to half forward when we've really missed his uh, pressure. And finally, Monocular says, thanks guys for all your hard work in getting these fabulous podcasts together. I just love them after a win. Of course, less so after a loss. However, I'm really looking forward to this one. Why does Frio seem to have our number, even previously when we have been playing well? Is it just their pace, run and length that mesmerizes our midfield and completely destroys our usually solid defense? Um, they seem to just run it out with someone going past them, uh, then a pass, then a forward running well deep of our zone over and over again. Is it their coach? Is their coach some sort of wizard who takes our game plan apart on a regular basis? Or perhaps we're just not as good as we have, have believed. The past fortnight, we did seem to be getting it together and I was starting to subscribe to the loading training planning for the July, August, September surge. But it now looks more and more despite my optimism that September uh, that September will be irrelevant. Uh, and we've got a, a voicemail from Rose Star that came in late. G'day, guys. Rose Star here again. Um, sorry, we're just speaking. So, um, yeah, appreciate it. But um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to Bin Man for holding up your end of the bargain the last two weeks. Um, and Andy, I think you can piss off back overseas, mate, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, since you've been back, uh, yeah, that wasn't a great showing, was it? Um, yeah, look, to get beaten the same way was pretty disappointing. I thought I'd just see if you guys had any thoughts on sort of why. That, that, I mean, they've kicked the, kicked the two biggest scores against us in the Goody era. Um, not just this year, which it has been this year, but that's been since Goody was coach. So um, pretty crazy to think how they do it. And we, I mean, we did arrest the flow this time, but we still lost every quarter. So that was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but to get beaten the same way is disappointing. When I mean, you get Brayshaw, Sarong, Young, the most posy, uh, just outworked us all game, didn't he? Um, and then giving the forwards so many looks out the back, and I guess that's the question: why? Why do they get so many looks out the back? Is it just speed on the ball that they they provide? Um, yeah, look, hard to know exactly much to take away from it. I mean, I thought. Billings, although, you know, he's the winning boy, actually did okay. He just can't kick over 30 metres. Um, and Colt was probably rightly subbed out, just a bit undisciplined. And Look, he looked frustrated and good to see he cared at least. Um, Milkshake was, I guess, the forward, not the target up there, but I don't know. I don't know. What do we do? Um, 
move on to the Giants next week and see how we go there and try not to try not to lose that one. Um, otherwise, I think it's probably curtains if we lose next week. But uh, he fell victim. Rostar fell victim to the two minute uh, time limit. <laughs> so just just a reminder: anyone calls in, you got two minutes. Get it in quick. Uh, short and succinct is the, is best. Um, uh, George, uh, are we Frio's bunnies, uh, or would we have lost to anybody yesterday the way we played? Uh, we're not just Frio's bunnies. We'll be further bunnies to come. Uh, these Frio games were pretty typical of the way we've played in the last six to eight weeks even, eight weeks. Um, people are too easy to forget that we beat North Melbourne by three points. We fell over the line against uh, the Eagles. Um, Essendon kicked the last four goals of the game, if I remember, we had a, when we had a seven-goal lead. Our team look, does not look fit at the moment, and we were exposed by a younger, fitter side yet again in this particular game. Particularly the the talent that Fremantle have in the midfield. Um, just have a look at those names: Sarong, uh, Young, Brayshaw. They're all twenty three. Um, Darcy's twenty six. Jackson's twenty two. They absolutely pants us in the middle and around, the, and more importantly, around the ground. Um, we look slow. Our half forwards were just appalling. There was a reason why the ball, the half forwards and the, our mids are slow. They looked unfit. Um, and there was a reason why the ball finished up in, in the um, defensive area so quickly is because there was no pressure whatsoever being put on the uh, Fremantle players as they picked the ball up, at, usually at the other end of the ground, and particularly in, in this game when we gave, gave it to them courtesy of turnovers. Um, They took full advantage of of the situation, but they are young and fit. I said a couple of weeks ago, we do not look fit at all. I think there's been an almighty cock up in the uh, training regime. Uh, Players look dead on their feet right from the start of the game. Um, And this was just another example of it. We'll get more of the same next week. Don't be confused by the Essendon game that was played in the wet. We were able to get lots of bodies around the ball and stop them moving the ball. If If that was in the dry, we would have lost that game easily as well. And again, in that game, we lost, we gave them the last four goals after us having a seven goal lead. Um, we're just not as good as what we have been led to believe. We're not as good as 2021. Our players are all older. Our talent's all older. The younger players that we've uh, recruited, some of them look promising, but they're not the replacements for the players that we had that won a premiership in 2021. Um, I'm afraid, folks, that we're in for a bit of pain to come. Our list isn't as good as uh, as um, as what people might think. Um, I know there's a lot of people have contrary views to that. Um, but I think we've got a, some very good parallels with a couple of other sides in the competition who are down at the bottom of the ladder at the moment. So, um, uh, yeah, both Mon- Mono and Super Swoop and Nor- Northy got it right. Um, we've got a lot more going on. I don't know what's going on in terms of the coaching staff. I'm, I don't blame um, Goody. I, he was furious in that um, in that uh, presser of his when he said, we set up to negate because we had no ruck. Well, that wasn't evident at all in this particular game. And as Binman said, it took us till half time to actually get the numbers to the ball. And the number of times, even on the centre bounces, uh, where our players were standing off the Fremantle players um, just to see them dance out of the centre and do what they wanted. Um, we'll talk about the um, the other bit of the recruiting, but um, yeah, it wasn't a very pleasant scene to watch, but I think we're going to be in for a lot more of that. Um, all right. Uh, Lazy says, uh, what cost us the game? Negative 32 clearances or scores from turnover? I believe no matter what game style uh, you play, getting belted in clearances like that, it puts you on the back foot in any game. You don't win too many games with that figure. I will say that uh, the pressure that Freo brought was off the charts and while we're not the best in executing under pressure, we failed miserably to prevent some of the turnovers that they scored off. Logue's response saying the effort of contest was pathetic. Gaundy the Great, and oh, the irony of that username uh, you, that username posting a question on this week of all weeks. Gaundy the Great says, uh, were the hitouts really to blame? We got smashed in a similar way the last time with Gorn, so it is our, is our stoppage. Uh, so is it our stoppage structure? What specifically is going wrong here? 
Spearer of Norm Smith says, other clubs can set midfield defensively when Gorn is a dominant rugman. Ruckman, why couldn't we? We got smashed. We couldn't set up to stop them coming out the front through stoppages or from the centre square. Clearance, spread, run, free a goal. And finally, Clintosaurus says, uh, was this one of those games where we were not fully wound up, to quote Big Man? One thing I noticed is their mids were on the move at every stoppage. Uh, which uh, would be expected as they were winning all the taps. Not much movement from ours. Would have expected some to try and shark a few, but hardly any. So, be man any defence of our impotent midfield or are, are we just, you know, we, we don't have Gorn, we don't have Petrarca, Brayshaw, uh, he's gone. Um, no, well, I mean, I think, I mean, to George nailed a couple of things is they, again, it should not be, discounted how well they played and how well they're going like you know they some of their leg speed was was just terrific um there is a you know it was good he's i watched it just a, an hour or so ago and he wasn't a happy camper um and i thought to be honest he was a bit tough on um fullerton because there was a question about you know you know he said a couple of times we don't have another ruck who could who would have won hit outs um and there was a double implication there i thought is like you know that was putting fullerton in a bit and he did point out what almost word for word what i said on the podcast last week is that fullerton hasn't been able to to win rucks at vfl level ruck tap outs his point was that they had no one else who's going to win tap outs and so therefore they um the plan was structural which i thought you know, so that question about in the question there about structure, I think there was a structural failing. They didn't um, have it set up properly. You know, I, I, it's hard to tell whether the high half forwards they did try to crowd it, but that that photo, of the pictures, the screenshots that are on the stats file thread on Demon Land, pretty good evidence that they didn't until the second half. And in the second half, I thought we that was when our was our best part of the game. We were quite, as I said, our pressure rating was good in the third quarter, uh, and we seemed to make it more difficult. Um, for them to get it out into space. You know, the, are we fit enough? I don't know. I think that definitely that was the worst sort of evidence of Clary's fitness. I thought he was given a, um, a you know, he he played behind a lot of time. He wasn't man on man. Um, he His energy looked really low. I think there is, you know, as I just noted before, it's a big ask for those young players to back up and that's where our leg speed is. Like AMW is our fastest player and a couple of times his leg speed was really impressive. Windsor too, you know, but both of them were down in terms of their coverage of the ground. And the other big one in the last two weeks in our two wins um, leading into this game, the Colt um, was our highest rated runner and uh, he was – not the player he he was in the last couple of weeks, that's for sure. So, um, you know, that they definitely look, as George noted, they look incredibly fit. They've had good leg speed for two or three years. Um, you know, our setups in the middle, they're definitely a structural uh, issue. You know, they de- I, I, Petty, I thought was, you know, his effort was fantastic, for, but he's no <laughs> classical ruckman, is he? <laughs> that's for sure. And, again, it's a young player asking Van Ruin to, you know, he just couldn't, like as I said from the player ratings, that was his worst performance of the year almost um, in terms of his rating. Well, it's and funny you say that. It, Everyone on Demonland uh, that gave votes in our vote player of the year thread, uh, he was in the top three of we have six, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. He was in the top three. I haven't three. looked at that. I haven't, but that's, I find that really surprising. And again, it's probably a good example of why it's important to look at the numbers because nothing at the numbers say scream. No. He had a good game <laughs> and, like, he definitely didn't in the ruck. But I, what I would say, and maybe this is where the votes came from, he still made an effort and he's a young fellow and he's been thrown to the wolves yeah. by having to ruck all season and and then take the ruck against two of the best uh, ruckmen in the AFL. So, um, you know, I think obviously we well, it's a bit different if we've got Maxi back in there. And, and actually one of the interesting things about Maxi, and there's been lots of talk in the last couple of weeks um, about Ruckman and their value, is where the a point that's been made about uh, Maxi actually, which is sort of inferred in one of those questions, is his value is in his tap ruck work because they're really not that influential anymore. Hit outs to an advantage are so rare. They're just not really that influential it's he's is what his clearance is his ability to win his own clearances and that's what um jackson did well i thought he won his own clearances and you know and being a player who can win contested possessions um and you know once the ball left the area we were chasing tail um 
Part of that was structure, though, definitely structure. Um, I also think, to be honest, they made a tactical error setting up that defence so aggressively like they did against the Bombers because, um, you know, like George suggests, when the Bombers were in that first quarter last week, they could have easily put a, a gap on us on the scoreboard. We, we looked like we were chasing tail once they got the ball out in the open last week. Um, I would have, you know, they went in with almost exactly the same game plan it looked like. I would have loved it if we'd played a bit deeper and gone back to our forward half, you know, and slow the game down, contested footy style. But, um, yeah, the, the the pace of the game was, you know, we struggled with, that's for sure. A couple of things. Uh, Gorn's, you know, it's his marking around the ground as well that we missed, mm. not saying that that would have uh, <laughs> changed anything this week. Uh, but there were a few times when the ball was uh, kicked Either way, that we just didn't have a big player to mark, but um, and flexibility because they, they the thing is that he gives Goody such good tactical flexibility because he could have put him back to, in defence, he could have swapped him in and and been a dangerous forward when we were struggling to get the ball there. Um, look, you know the drop off intensity in the running. I mean, George is right that that question about whether we're fit enough. It's hard to argue that we are fit enough. I'm hoping, of course, that um, we're on the upward trajectory still. Um, and this game doesn't p- dissuade me from that particularly. Um, I just think there's a real challenge with young players getting up, you know, having so many of our players in this team, almost 50% of our players, 22 and under, um, getting up week in, week out, and particularly when you're asking a player like JVR to smash into the wall you know, the ruck every time, you know, 15, 20, 30 times a game. Just as equally, though, Bin Man, uh, I think our senior, a lot of our senior players look very, very slow in this game. Well, yeah, uh, and, I mean, that's but, a point you've yeah. made a lot before. Yeah. We've got, but, they are slow, aren't they? That's and but yeah. Clary looks super slow, didn't he? He, he he's, he's he's obviously unfit, but people like um, Melcham who can barely get out of a trot. Yeah, uh, it's not surprising the ball comes out of the half back, the half forward line really quickly. Um, Fritter doesn't run hard at all. Um, no, and uh, Jack, Jack, game. Jack Viney is not fast and never has been. You don't can't no. expect him to be. No, um, we've got two young player, two younger players in Petty and JVR being absolutely knocked senseless in the yeah. middle. They they can't be expected to chase tail. Um, and that's, and uh, you're right. And in this game too, I don't know what, what you guys thought, but Cos looked off. Oh, well, like, yeah, he only got six possessions in the whole and he game. Just didn't he and, just didn't look. He uh, just didn't look right. Like he, uh, his body language is poor. I thought he, he mm. looked lively early, and then I didn't notice him for a long, long time. But, and he wasn't doing it like last week. Um, you know, one of the themes of last week was our rundown tackling, and you know, we just that w- wasn't evident. So you're right, George. Our se- senior players have always been slow, and I think that question about what's Frio's kryptonite. They got to be the fastest team in the AFL. Yeah. Maybe Hawthorne. Hawthorne yeah. or Frio. You know, they're phenomenal. How quick they are. Forget the. Um, What's the number thirty-two for them? The uh, not Walt uh, Young. No, no, no. Um, African player Fre- Fredericks or the uh, Fredericks. Yeah. Uh, um, he's pace. They showed footage of him. Basically, he ran the length of the ground, and and when he he had already run a fair way, and um, we couldn't go with him. And there was another one where Lever. So speaking of senior players who aren't that quick over the ground, I thought Lever had a very average game, and there was a goal that um, Tracy kicked where it was a brilliant end to end goal by them, and their ball movement was phenomenal. Um, but you could see what was happening, and Tracy ran into open space, almost started with Lever and Lever just could not go with him. Um, I mean, no, probably, that's probably no shock against Tracy, but he's a younger fella. But you're right, George, that, that our senior player's leg speed is, you know, and then you add May, May's not quick, is he? So, yeah, yeah no. The, the, the other factor that we we haven't really looked at is we've got so many players playing out of their right, out of their proper positions, trying to fill holes at the moment, you know. Um, because Gorn's not there, we've got... Um, Petty and, and JVR, who should be up the forward line kicking goals um, for us instead of having to compete against monster rucks and two of them at that. Um, even Cozzy, uh, I don't, I can't recall that he played any time in the forward half. He was constantly around the ball because we had to. Um, we've got Rivers, who's who's our best driver from from the half back line, playing in the midfield. Um, we're just plugging holes all over the ground at the moment with players out of position. It's not surprising that we get the results. But, yeah, I, I still think we do, do not look fit at all for this time of the season in particular. 
Mm. And when yeah, it's, if we're not, then well, yeah. you, you, both of your predictions will be correct. So uh, I, you know, we'll certainly get a bit, better gauge on it next week. But um, I'll give you, I'll give you the number of good travel agents, and you can book something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Pretty man. laughs> starting, we're starting to convert you. Um, <laughs> Buck Naked says, uh, "Wow, we just had our pants pulled down, outworked, and outplayed all day." Can you comment on our newfound fragility? Previously, our defence would be in place and we would we were hard to score against. On Sunday, they got so many goals over the back, suggesting we played too high and didn't run back hard enough. We may have a game that stands up in finals, but playing like that, we have no chance of making it. Spirit Norm Smith says, out the back, why did we concede 13 goals from turnovers and the five goals uh, for Frio by forwards being all alone in the forward 50? Defenders playing 15 metres off their players. Why? How? Uh, Ben says, uh, why do we press up so high? A footy ground is much bigger than a basketball court and I don't think we have the fitness to execute this properly. Last line of defence shouldn't be halfway up the ground. Bucknecked responds this, uh, the old method had us uh, being almost impossible to get the ball past the last 80 metres. Teams could burn through plus 20 inside 50s for no benefit. Now all the back six press way up, meaning over the back goals are simple if you run hard the other way against the Ds. May and Lever do not defend well this way. They are so much better when the ball is coming at them. If everyone presses up and we lose the contents, contest, which we did all day, then a few slick overlap ha- passes and an easy deep inside 50 entry and goal awaits. This method only works if we dominate contest and don't turn it over in easy spots. So George, uh, the defence at times seemed to be a shambles, uh, but uh, this was inevitable given Frio's quick ball movement. Um, <sighs> anything about the, uh, the way the... Uh, we press up too high or were did for this game? I've been waiting to say this to George. You're on mute, George. Oh, George. George there we go. Right. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. I think it was all summed up uh, in Buck Naked's last sentence. Uh, don't turn it over in easy spots. Um, there were 13 goals co- that came from turnovers. You really can't blame the defence when we give 13 goals worth away up the field, particularly to a side that – that is fit and capable and just run. Um, uh, Looking at the defence just from the defensive structures, we might have been playing up a little bit higher than what we normally did because we had to. We had to get more bodies up and around the ball that we were trying to do. But it's not surprising when when, when you turn it over at that half-forward line um, and it goes back the other way, you're going to go straight over the top of the defenders. How The first thing is don't turn it over. And the second thing is, once again, where were the half forwards and where were the mids that were stopping that transition? They just sailed through the – Fremantle sailed through the middle of the ground, unhindered, absolutely unhindered, the whole length of the ground. So it's not surprising. I'm not blaming the, the – um, uh, the defenders, the defensive structure depends on it being slowed as it comes into the defence. You can't expect otherwise with fast movement. Collingwood um, won a premiership on that basis last year of moving the ball quickly so that the defence can't set up. Um, in this game, we didn't have that at all and we're, we're missing missing our talent up the field. Once again, we don't look fit um, to be able to stop that sort of run and that's the consequences you get. I, mean, I, I agree totally that the – what. What we were missing in this game that we had in spades against Essendon was our all-team defence was chalk and cheese between the two weeks. So last week we were covering, we were slowing the ball movement, we were getting across the man, the mark against the Bombers. They that they were very similar methodologies that the two teams used. And this this week we couldn't get across. The, 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 the Optus Oval is even more circular than the MCG and the Dockers did a great job of using the complete width of it but clearly looking to exploit our lack of... Of run um, and so totally agree that you can't blame the back six you know it's an all-team defense pressure on the ball carrier but also not turning it over in in challenging spots but we're definitely in the last couple of weeks we're definitely playing much higher and much more aggressive up the ground against the bombers and um free no, no doubt about it in this game there's no question so the, those questions are really good you know I, for me those three questions are the game in a um, nutshell really uh is and it also points to a few challenges one of which is 
you know, we've had a particular method for three, four years under Goody, um, and our defence is, as George has noted and we've talked about a lot, is all based on structure, role, everyone knowing where they're supposed to be in that system. And just this year, we're, we're trying all different me- methods of that. And one of them is playing a much more a high half press. Um, and what happened to us is exactly what's happening to Collingwood at the moment. They can't get back on D when it gets turned over. They don't have the leg speed or the run or whatever you want to call it to get back and cover. In times gone past, we've we've solved that dilemma by if we do turn turn the ball over, we're always set behind the ball. But we've got we've got um, May up at the middle of the the ground, and as Jones pointed out in the coverage, it wasn't to the second half that they changed that a little bit and went back to what um, Jones would have been used to when he was playing at Melbourne of that sort of diamond defense with uh, the goalkeeper at the back of that structure. Um, so. It, I mean, it really does point to one of the challenges, forgetting, you know, any of where we're at, the challenges of implementing a new method. And I think in a funny way, we saw the opposite for Frio. Frio have been using a variation of this method for the last three seasons. Uh, and they looked like they knew where they were supposed to be at any given time. They looked like they were on the same page. Um, and for the first time in a long time, you know, it looked like we didn't, you know, where there was some finger pointing down back and there was people not running to the right place. Um, but your point's a good one, George, about, you know, you can't just put that on the de- defence. That's partly also on Goody for going into this game with that style, rolling the dice on it, if you like, but also to do with, uh, you know, not getting help from the midfielders and the high half forwards and the halfback flank, putting massive pressure on the ball carrier. To, to cough it up. Um, but, you know, the, again, I keep coming back. This is the theme for years now is that I keep coming back to a lot of our turnovers. Of course, they were to do with the pressure that Frio were putting on us, but a lot of them were just technically terrible kicks. So we gave up the ball too often when we just, you know, kicked to them basically. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter what game plan you've got. If you've got too many players with poor technique, kicking technique, you're going to expose yourself to giving up turnovers. But and, and what Frio did, as you pointed out, George, the key was they hurt us. They turned it over and went hard, went quick, went wide. Uh, and I, I thought it was, a, yeah, tactically it was curious that they didn't go back to a more traditional D's Goodwin defensive system or structure until it was too late, basically. Um Travi14 says, uh, good to have you back, gents, to what, gents while Goody uh, should be commended uh, for the ruck decisions against the Bombers in the wet. He also needs to be condemned for zero rucks against Jackson and Darcy and WA in perfect conditions. The ball was dry this week, so they could use the hit out, uh, hit out advantage. Spirit of Norm Smith says, uh, so we lost Jackson and recruited Grundy. Uh, we then traded away Grundy after a short uh, uh, experiment. Uh, problem uh, 2024. Why no plan uh, for a backup ruck to support Gorn or a plan B for when and if Gorn gets injured? That's poor list management, poor coach management. Magnus says, uh, can we say our ruck experiment is over and we need to cough up dollars during the off-season or get Varel and Fullerton up to the learning curve fast? So B-Man is uh, Travi 14, right? Uh, Goody was hard last week for the ruck decision in the wet conditions, uh, but should we be condemned this week for not utilising a ruck? Uh, do we even have a backup ruck that could compete against two guns in dry conditions? Uh, is the Grundy trade one of the worst trades in our history, given we don't have a backup for Max? Uh, are our mids and or our coaches to blame for not setting up for being dominated in the hitouts? And I'll take my answer off the air. Do you take your <laughs> say again? You'll I'll take, take my answer head. off the air. <laughs> so. Classical um, radio uh, or, caller in the comment. Right. The, um, well, the first question, you know, I, I mean, it's an interesting one because the forecast was for it to be wet all week. And the irony of um, the irony was I was wanting it to be wet um, because I think George's point's a good one around it's sort of one of the advantages of mitigating their their advantage last week against the Bombers was it was wet and slippery. And so you, when you bring extras and make congestion, you get good value for your congestion dollars, so to speak. And um, um, so I couldn't believe it when it was dry. <laughs> so we can add dry to one of the conditions Melbourne don't play well in, to, to <laughs> spongy grass, <laughs> wet. Um, so, look, you know, again, it, it's a little bit about the question of, 
you know, we only were down, what was it, what did I say, down 14 um, points for scores from stoppages. So it's not really about, you know, apart from the territory, that's definitely a point, but it, it's about impact. So I think, you know, that points to the comments that George made before is, what where was our structure where where was our setup you know was that did they get that right this week um there's definitely that there uh, you know goody was furious on the weekend and uh, in the presser uh, and as i said i feel like he put you know it was a bit unfair on fullerton it fe- fe- felt to me like he was throwing him under the bus a little bit and um which i didn't love um but his point remains a valid one is that you know, if you're not dominating at the ruck level in VFL, how are you going to go against Darcy or, you know, are really, is really, would have he given us anything more? I don't think I'm full of, and Pharrell's not fit enough. And so what do you do? Put another slow bloke in there who's not yet ready, you know. Pharrell probably would have been a better, well, I, I personally would, select Varel ahead of Fullerton because he's a genuine ruck Varel, but he's still not, he's not dominating at VFL level either. So he probably, to be fair, good if he was going to pot Fullerton, he should have potted both of them because neither of them would get close to the best VFL team, ruck team, would they, George? No, and um, I think Varel's got a better future, but Varel's not going, probably not going to make it at AFL level because I think he's only 198. Well, he's not. That's what I mean. So he's hardly. He's not even that big. Yeah. I think. I've, I reckon he's definitely got a future. I've got it, but he's. I reckon he's a good twelve months, two years away. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I, that's why Goody was. So, he was so ready for those questions, and he. I think he was angry and so not happy, and so I'm not really super. That was not one of his more impressive performances. I have to say, Goody, in terms of the presser, but, but he was honest, wasn't he? At the end but of he, the day. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he almost said exactly what I said last week on the podcast is, well, come on, what do you expect? The guy, if you can't dominate at VFL level, like VFL is such a drop-off from AFL now. Yeah, I watched huge. the game on the weekend. I thought, it's come huge, on, yeah. it's like, you know, really, Frankston, Casey, it looked like a game from the 80s at VFL level. You know, if you cannot dominate at that level, what's Darcy going to do to you? Like, and so I thought Petty was, you know, as I said, the, these player rating, he was our second highest player uh, rated player. So um, as for the talk about, you know, I think it is a, a good question. Could have we had a better ruck, you know, in terms of, in terms of our list management, but again, I get a little bit on um, list, list management's not really my area or not, at my area of expertise at all. And I'm amazed people who know, like George and others on Demon Land, who have got really good knowledge about players coming up and all of that stuff. I i don't even pretend to know about it. But what I do know is that what are we going to – we got Proust, for instance. So did, how long does a player you bring in Proust who's going to play at VFL level for the whole season with the opportunity to, to fill in for Max when he's injured for two or three weeks? You know, or someone I mentioned, what's the big player that um, Bomber's got? Um, the Roos- Goldstein. Right, well, Goldstein. Is Goldstein going to see at his career, you know, playing second fiddle to Maxi? So there's not like there's a surfeit of, of AFL-ready blokes kicking around the country in seconds or even in a, other AFL team who want to come to Melbourne and play at Casey. I mean, so, like, I, I, I get that, that challenge. Burrell's part of the answer. Personally, I think that ultimately Maxi's sort of a bit of a rod to our own back, but we might end up going, the question is, I, it's, I think it's a legitimate question, is how influential are really elite rucks? Um, and, you know, so maybe Varel's a, a view to the future. The Grundy thing, I find that really, to be honest, really frustrating, the, the criticism the club gets for Grundy. So we tried it. We, last year we went, we did exactly that we went out to the market we got a player um who would come to the club who's an elite ruck who could give maxi a chop out and we tried the experiment we tried playing them together maxi's um, performance dropped off a cliff is that on maxi maybe he said as much this year he said as much that maybe he could have d- done some things differently but nonetheless we tried the experiment and it didn't work and what now what are people criticizing melbourne for allowing grundy to go when he was contracted, I mean, come on. Like, it's a bit like you can't, you know, having your cake and eat it too. So it's definitely an issue for us that we haven't got a legitimate backup ruck. But, you know, I don't know the other clubs, George, you probably do better. There's probably a lot of other clubs who haven't really got a great backup ruck and that if their number one goes down, they haven't got many other options. Yeah, there's, I think the only answer, you know, and again, it's with, with retrospect, you know, um, is that, most other clubs have got some log 
who's sitting in the VFL who's capable of standing in the middle and, and you know putting a body on a body and that's m- not much more. Unfortunately, we don't even have that. It would say. And so. Fullerton's not that. I watched on the weekend. Oh, no, he, and he, he, is, he is. He is. He's not, not a big fella. Like. No, 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 he's not. He's not built for that. And um, I don't think he he was uh, a backup ruck when we played Brisbane in the finals um, two years ago, was it? Uh, but beyond that, he's never played ruck. No, he's not really. He's a forward yeah. ruck who can yeah. pinch hit in the ruck, yeah. Yeah. not a ruckman who goes yeah. down forward. And uh, as we say, Varel's a while's off. So it is a legitimate question. I, I remember you mentioned this. Um, Magic Door was a big loss in terms of yeah. him for losing for Casey, like the the, the – the, the challenge of not having a good ruck at Casey so everyone can practice their structures around that good ruck. Um, but he was the exact sort of footballer who that we could bring into this game, for instance. He would have, if he was playing at that level, even at the level yep. he was playing the year he retired, he I would have had him straight into this and I'm sure Goody would have as well because, as you said, he would have been strong enough to wrestle Darcy and to compete at those around-the-ground stoppages. The big one for me in this game was I thought, and he didn't get any criticism that I, well, I don't know, I didn't read Demon Land much for the last 24 hours, but I didn't hear this mentioned, is Turner got completely schooled and he was, like, he wasn't much help in the ruck at all. As I already mentioned, JVR got schooled as well. Petty was, in fact, our best ruckman on the day and he gets criticised, um, you know, to the cows come home. Track Forever says, uh, I just want uh, to shout out to, uh, a shout out to B-Man for an absolutely amazing job he's done over the last two weeks with uh, with your support as well, Andy. I've loved hearing the stats and just wanted to say a big thank you. Uh, why do you see uh, – why do we see the form of our ever-reliable players like Salem, Chandler and Clary drop off so much? Travi14 says, two players I'd like to know where you think they are at this stage of their career uh, as they worry me is Bowie and Sparrow. Bowie in particular has been very average, uh, missing targets, pulling out of contests and looking lost defensively of times. What do you guys think? Doug Rema says, Salem, what's happened to him? Uh, looks disinterested and has next to no impact on games, lots of sideways kicking. Has the game gone past him? Has he too much class to fade into? He has too much class to fade into mediocrity. How do you think we can use him better? And we've got a voicemail from uh, good mate Salty. Hey boys, Salty here. Um, really felt like that game just never really turned up to it. Um, midfield seemed to get dominated from the get go. Don't know if the, the ruck made that big a difference, but it certainly seemed like the pressure they were able to put through their midfield just really. We really weren't able to handle it, and the clearance numbers reflected that for the most part. Um, I want to ask you all about your thoughts on. I, th- I think our middle tier of our of our team just really hasn't been been that good this year. Um, I think that our younger ones are playing pretty well, but uh, middle tier not really getting it done. So I just wanted to get all all your thoughts on um, Sparrow, uh, Bowie, Salem. Um, me, they're those, these sort of guys that you know, have been in the system a long time, so in particular, and just, just not getting it done. Um, yeah, Sparrow in particular, you know, we, we, we essentially chose him over Jordan, and Jordan's gone away and got significantly better, and Sparrow just seems like this, yeah, uh, for all these great priests, and form hasn't really done much in the actual season, so I just want to get your thoughts on them. I still think we should play the kids, put a fork in the season, get the best draft pick we can, go and get a key forward and an actual second ruckman and reload for 2025. Hope you all enjoy your holidays. Uh, cheer me up, please. <laughs> cheer you up. All right, we'll try. Uh, uh, George, any <laughs> thoughts on some of the uh, mid-tier or even some of our usually more reliable players that seem to have dropped off this season? Sparrow, B- Bowie, Salem, um, You've come. You've come to the wrong person to cheer you up. Sorry, salty. So, uh, um, yeah, that, this this has been a real concern for us. I, um, certainly with Salo, um, uh, once again, just revisiting history. Had thyroid problems before the season. Didn't really start training until March. Um, then he got a what was it a, a, a quad injury, if I remember, or foot injury. I can't remember, quad uh, or knee knee. Um, comes back and um, didn't play in the last quarter in this game due to hamstring tightness. Not surprising. Um, we've we've talked about it. If you don't get a decent preseason, then you're not going to have a decent season. Same applies to Clary. Um, 
Uh, he was in and out. Um, he was sent home at one stage. There's all sorts of things which are suggested going on in the background. Whether or not they're correct or not doesn't really matter because he didn't have a proper football preseason, so it's not surprising. Um, Sparrow has been a real disappointment, though. Um, to you know, certainly in 21 after the uh, at the grand final and the premiership, he looked like the next one who was going to take that next step. Um, to be a really um, potent part of the uh, midfield, but three years later now, um, he hasn't taken any any further steps, um, which is a real disappointment. Bowie, um, yeah, he doesn't look like he he has been um, difficult to judge, particularly in this game because the defence was under so much pressure um, with the ball coming in. Normally, he's the he's one of the guys who cleans up. Um, uh, once the structures are in place, but we didn't have the structures in place. Um, we didn't have the opportunity because the ball just kept going over the defenders' heads. Um, but once again, he uh, suffered that injury early on in the season. Um, it's difficult to come back from any injuries, but um, yeah, he hasn't quite quite come up quite done as much. I would have preferred that he actually played in the ruck in this game because it wouldn't have made any difference um, to the to the outcome. Uh, you might as well get him in the middle and we wouldn't have had to waste JVR and uh, and Petty um, from their proper roles. So, yeah, it's, I think these, these are symptomatics of, of the whole um, team at the moment. We've got injured players. When you take out your quality players out of any side, um, your performance drops off and we're suffering right across the ground with all of these sort of players. And, I, and the second-level players... Um, Get exposed, unfortunately, um, when the when the better players aren't there. Um, when you've got a Petrarca and you've got a Gorn and you've got a, a Clary at, at full tilt, um, everybody looks good good around them. But when they're not there or not up to the standards that they've set, then the other second tier players get really exposed, and people start to understand that they're second tier players because they are second tier players. The um. I thought Billings was speaking of second tier players. I thought Billings was pretty good when he came on, and sort of a way to think of his game. He had his rating, player rating was eight point three. Caleb Windsor who was on the game for what was his eighty four percent time. Uh, Jack Billings was only on the ground forty one percent. Was uh, his player rating was um, eight point four, so almost exactly the same. And Clayton Oliver, who was uh, on the ground for what was his. Um, Eighty-four percent. Eighty-four percent. He he was only eight, only eight point five, and mm-hmm. so like he's not one of those. I mean, he's this game. He, he felt like a middle tier player. Um, Chandler rating was only nine. Yeah. Ed Langdon's rating was only nine. Um, and you know, for me, this is one. This so I, I think that's a really good point actually about those sort of middle rung players. Salo hasn't um, had a, a great season um, in some respects, and it certainly hasn't been doing any damage. That's the thing we, we have. That was one of the things that jumped out for me against Freer. How many of their players did damage? Like they were damaging. Um, we didn't really, you know, particularly with Coz. Like he was so dynamic last week, as I mentioned. He, you know, his rating was twenty three for that game. Um, you know, he, he's, he just was not the same sort of player this week. And if you just if you don't have those players, it's really hard, as you say, George, even for the middle run players. But the one that, uh, you know, I've, I'm not one to knock and sort of I think he gets misunderstood a little bit, but I, I thought it was another average game from, uh, speaking of Cosy, he's average. So he had his 23 last week was his uh, player rating, 7.2 in this game. Um, that's a massive drop off. Like that's going from coaches' votes to you know not getting drop territory, but um, that's pretty average. But the player that concerns me, who shouldn't be even considered a middle tier player, is definitely not. But he he he's playing like it sometimes. Not every week is Fritter. Um, I don't know how you guys saw Fritter's game. Um, um, much the same as the last six weeks, quite frankly. Um, and, and just yeah, some concerning yeah, body language stuff. That, yeah. You know, um, he he doesn't chase, and we talked about this two years ago. When we we're in the same position, when yeah, yeah. Melcham and Fritter in the same forward line, neither who chase or can chase. Um, that really just that's that's one of the reasons the ball comes out so quickly out of the back line. Sorry, our our forward line heads down the other end. You've got a number of players who who just aren't putting the pressure on on the um, the way the balls um, operating inside the forward fifty. 
Um, I think between the two of them, they only had one tackle. Well, yeah, Frida had zero tackles. Yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. and that's uh, just, and that goes. I spoke before about our pressure inside fifty and those weird anomalous numbers around our contested um, pressure. Um, you know, like he only had. I mean, like Cosy at least had five um, tackles. Uh, what did so? I'm just looking. Actually, but, he had yeah, one but, tackle. Frida. Frida had one tackle. Um, but Jake um, Billings, I thought, had, you know, he had eight pressure acts, uh, Jake Billings, in, you know, in a quarter of footy. And in a whole game of footy, Frida only had eight um, pressure acts. To me, that that's sort of not good enough from a senior player when, you know, it's exactly what you're saying. Uh, you know, they were able to transition it from our forward line. Part of the puzzle is players not at all parts of the ground, putting pressure on them and, and making it difficult and bringing him to ground and getting up to the mark and doing all of those one percenters. Uh, Track Forever says, of all the young players, who do you believe has the most upside? Um, Monocular says, uh, when and if September becomes a mathematical impossibility, will we change our plans and drop those who aren't by then committed to 2025 and beyond and bring in even more young blood Kiner Brown had an unbelievable number of tackles of VFL and needs time on ground at AFL level. All the youngsters uh, we blooded this year have been more than serviceable. Windsor, of course, the standout. Howes looks as if he will make it. Uh, Colt was, in my opinion, unlucky to be subbed out and has added just so much energy to the forward line. AMW just fits right in. Seston, Varel, uh, not sure about McAdam and Fullerton, though. Uh, so let's take a little break and talk some positives before we get back into MFCSS uh, territory, guys. Uh, Big man, which of our young guns has the most upside? And I, I know you won't concede it yet, but if September becomes a mathematical poss- impossibility, uh, should we just throw the kids in? Well, working back from that question, <laughs> let's say, well, I don't think it, it won't become a mathematical um, <laughs> impossibility, like really, because it won't for many teams. I mean, it, just look at the ladder, just forgetting Melbourne and forgetting our sort of emotional being tied into it. Um, it like, it is remarkable. The The ladder is just nuts. Like, so, yeah, we got beaten by Freya and it was, it was um, terrible, but we remain, you know, only four points behind the team. We're favourites or come in equal favourites to beat next week in the Giants. You know, so it's... It is incredibly close. We beat the Giants next week. We'll be on level points with them um, and we'll be back inside the eight. We're only six points from fourth. I mean, it was such a, a opportunity. We would have been in fourth. That's how close it is. If we'd won this game, we would have been fourth despite all of the, you know, woe is us, Melbourne are terrible. We, we were, the reality is the ladder doesn't lie and we're two points out of the eight. Well, like, do, you want some we, mathema- you know, do you want some mathematics uh, thrown into the equation at the moment? Uh, because there was a... a, a, a go for it. There was as a, long as it doesn't a, tell a bad tale. Well, it tells... Could, could, potentially could. Uh, uh, there's a, an account on uh, Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days called Winnable. And they uh, produced uh, some percentages. Um, so at the moment, um, uh, our percentage to make top four uh, is 3%. Um, I'm not sure how they've worked all this out. Uh, but for the top eight at the moment, it's 31%. If we win this week... Our okay, t- so 31%, right? 30, so that's a one in three chance of making the eight. Okay. You, one in three. Okay. And so if you ask your average Demon Land poster, it'd be one in 30 of the tone of, <laughs> of posting over the last, no, honestly. Okay. All right. like, I've got so some more one stuff. in three chance is is like, what's that? That's uh, f- two like in three chance. It's two and three chances of not making it. <laughs> that's how I see it. Of course it, it is, but that is the way, yeah, like that's, that works. Yeah, of course it's. All right, so but, if we win, I've got to one sec, you can continue yep. in a sec. So if we win this week, uh, we're a 4% chance of top four. I think we can count out top four at the moment. Uh, all right. Uh, but if, and if we win, top eight's 44%. So, uh, B man, you get. We win this week. We're a fifty-fifty chance of making the top, and that's <laughs> oh. just like that's not a. You're that's not me being a positive. There, that's just yeah. a fact. Um, and then if we lose this week, uh, we're a zero percent, the zero percent chance of making the top four. So let's forget top four. Uh, if we lose this week, we're a thirteen percent chance of making the top eight. So yeah, so this week's important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can continue. Yeah. That's your so, mathematics. All right, that's, but that's really, to be honest, that makes my point. Yes, you could say, well, we're two two out of three chances of not making it. 
you know, but we're also a third of the chance of making it, right? So even that's that's how close this season is. Um, and that's just the reality. If we beat the, uh, um, uh, the, the Giants this week, we're likely to be back in the eight. So, yes, it was a bad loss, but, you know, we're still in the season. Like, you know, whether we can be a contender at top four, whether we can compete against the Swans in their, their current form. You know, that's a that's a, perhaps a different conversation. But, you know, let's, let's at least be realistic about w- what our chances are uh, of making the eight. And if we make the finals this year, it will, you know, provide a lot of people would see that as a victory, wouldn't they, given, um, you know, given the struggles we've had. So that point about, though, just going back to the question about bringing the kids in, let's say, let's say hypothetically it goes to zero and you missed a squiggle <laughs> thing yeah, just yeah. there, right? <laughs> you know, we play the kids. Who exactly would we play? Yeah. Which kids would we play? Like we're not going to be playing Varel because it's no good no, for his no, career. No, no. He's any like point Brown. bringing Jefferson in at this stage of his career, a picket fence on Demon Lamb would would very much like um get a picket fence if you're out there. He'd very much like um Jefferson to be brought in for Petty, who by the way had his best game for the season <laughs> in the weekend. Just God, so he's not going anywhere. So what do you do? You which kids exactly would you put? The only one, the only player I could see coming from Casey is the one that it already has is Pup. Um, and there's not a single other player who I could see, or Laurie maybe, but he's not. that's not hardly Laurie's playing not the kid, is it? He's the same age as Bowie. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's not as – we have been playing the kids, haven't it? Is, um, in case everyone, anyone's <laughs> not noticed, that's what we have been playing. That's what I keep saying. We had, you know, again a younger team than Frio. Again, the same with the Bombers. Again, the previous week against the Eagles. And the same – almost similar demographic, almost identical to the Roos who are in the second or third year of a rebuild. So we have been playing the kids. The first question, who do I think has got the most upside of our young players – I reckon um, uh, McVeigh. I think McVeigh's got the most upside. I could see him becoming um, our our Dacos. He's. Uh, I think he's. He just. Uh, he was terrific in this game. He was brilliant last week. Um, he. I. Th- he's got an ability to play on bigs on smalls. Uh, I, I. I think he's got enormous upside. And my my sense is, in the two or three years' time, he'll be talked about um, in the same way that uh, Nick Dacos is. Uh, he he's got time and space. He's got an ability to make quick decisions. Um, his ceiling is super high. You know, Windsor's an obvious one. He he's a jet. Um, Colt looks like he's got the talent um, and the drive. Um, but for me, the most upside is Judd McVie. I'll go for um, I'll go for Windsor um, simply because it's his it's his very first year and he has played every single game. And he moves so well, and he's still running hard yeah. for, for a young player. You know what? What are we? Seventeen rounds into this season, um, he's built like a stick, but he's um, resilient. He he reminds me so much of Robbie Flower the way that he's able to extricate himself from um, from uh, contest. Um, the way that he reads the play so beautifully, I think I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of him in into the future. But totally agree with Bin Man. Who are the kids that we're not playing? There's there's simply none at Casey. We've been playing Wode and we've been playing um, uh, Colt. We've been playing Laurie. We've been uh, we've been playing uh, these young guys. The sad fact is we don't have a great deal of depth at Casey to be able to to play anymore. You're not going to bring in Jefferson. You're not going to bring in Varel. Um, they need not to. Yet. Be, not yet. Yeah, they'll they, come in. They'll get yeah, it to the side. But they, they need to be developed. The worst thing yeah. you could possibly do would be to bring both either of those players in at this stage and get them absolutely smashed uh, by someone. You know, let's say against GWS, have got a very good backline. Um, Particularly Jefferson. Sp- yeah, he's a future player. You don't yeah. wreck now for future, do you? No, and there's no point. Um, if you if you're throwing the season away, why th- throw away the potential that you might have for the future with these guys? But other than those, we, we don't have a great deal. Of, we've got a lot of list cloggers down at Casey uh, that are going to take two years to get rid of, quite frankly, um, and it's going to take take a long time to get the players that we need to replace them up to the uh, required levels. So, um, yeah, we're already playing the young ones that, w- that we have got available. But that's, I mean, I guess that goes to your two-thirds 
chance of not making a one third as as we've talked about is I think our list of uh, young players is is almost the best in the AFL. The only one that comes, I, I think, you know, Frio, as you noted, they've got some good young players. Ruse have got some phenomenal Ruse, young Ruse players. Ruse are going to be challenging. Yeah. Ruse Next have got year. some phenomenal young players yeah. like that. She's always, yeah. I struggle with, he's underrated, I reckon. That's how good he is. Yeah. It's just Wardlaw's the same. Wardlaw's the same. So I think we're well positioned. I think, you know, that's one of the positives. No matter what happens in this season, no matter where we go from here, we have been playing the young players. So Colt will have 15 games under his belt coming into next season. Windsor will have played a full season of AFL football. Pup's had his debut. You've got Turner who who might end up being a key position forward for us for 10 years. You know, you've got Van Ruin who's just turned 21. Like he is just 21. I saw Logan McDonald on the weekend. He's a year older, um, maybe two years older than, um, uh, than JVR. He's still you know, hasn't got close to his potential. JVR won't be at his best till he's 23, 24. He's got another three years before he's there. So the future looks super bright on that front. I agree with Windsor. One of the things that Windsor's, uh, you know, he's, he's a natural footballer like McV. One of the things I love about him is that he makes good decisions, you know, quickly. Uh, and But of upside, I reckon I've been really pleasantly surprised with Andy Meniz-Wakefield. He's the sort of player like... Um, uh, Labashain in, in test match cricket, that when they go up a level, they seem to be able to play better at a higher level than, um, you know, when the the um, w- when the when ball's moving quickly. And, um, you know, I, I thought he, he didn't have a great game on the weekend, just gone, but um, he's been really excellent. His upside could be really, um, you know, big, particularly if he can play that small defender role that I've been talking about. I think we'll burn through the next couple of questions quickly. Uh, just uh, on tagging, oh, my D's ass, uh, why didn't we put a tag on Hayden Young? He was killing us coming off the half-back line into the centre square and helping Freo get clearance time and time again. So, George, any thoughts on on our lack of tagging this week? Or, no, sim- or did we sim- even simple, try? Sim- simple, <laughs> simple answer is pretty much the same as the previous one. Who you, who would you like to put on? Well, AMW, <laughs> uh, not AMW, uh, Nibbler has been, uh, Nibbler, been yeah, yeah, as effective who, who as you going to put on? Yeah, who are you going but to put on Sir Rongo yeah, Brayshaw? So, well, that's then. the thing. It's a... And we still got absolutely, utterly, completely pantsed. Yep. All right. I don't think we need to go on with that. Uh, there you go, oh, my Ds. Uh, Jabroni asks, uh, when does re- reality set in? Uh, we are not as good as we think we are. So, uh, big man, uh, you're not the person to ask. Of this Wrong episode. person. I was about to say, well, perhaps you're the who's perfect reality? Person to ask. If you read Demon Land, no one thinks we're any good. This is so, you know, if it's your two's reality, well, that you've crossed that Rubicon a long time ago, haven't you? So, if it's my reality, I. I I still think we're good. Um, so, uh, you know, it probably I'll go to my grave going that Mighty D's are uh, and the last get a chance at top four. The last person who crossed the Rubicon took over Rome. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I bet it was well coached. His structure was good. Was oh, behind, yeah, was, behind yeah, the yeah. ball. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still, still think we can win the whole thing? Uh <laughs> Uh, yes, if everything <laughs> falls right, it's in that category. It's in the Bradbury, it's in the Stephen Bradbury. Well, no, no, uh, look, here's my theory of the argument: is that I, I think football's changing before our eyes, and fitness, as I've been talking about now for a year and a half, two years, is I think it becoming, you know, next to the depth of your list, and and I, I actually, you know, personally think coaching's overrated. Now, I have always thought that that the you need the cattle, so cattle number one. You need luck, um, but I think more and more um, high performance programs um, are the defining feature of the game in terms of chances of winning a flag. The game has become so aerobically challenged. I'm positive that that's a huge factor in these incredibly volatile results, like Geelong won four of their last five games, lose at home to the Dogs. The Dog got flogged by Port. They come out and beat the Blues the next week. The, the, if you just if you take off your Melbourne supporting hat and look at it um, just in terms of the results, and because I punt um, on the line, I'm always looking at these numbers in terms of the the um, the, the uh, line, in terms of the gap between the teams, the winning margin uh, or the losing margin, whatever the case may be. And it's all over the shop this year. And so's total match points. Like I'm not even betting on total match points this year because it's so volatile. Games that you think are going to be low scoring or high scoring, um, games that are high you think are going to be high scoring or low scoring, and it's got everything to do where 
teams are at when they meet each other in terms of how fresh they are and how, you know, like 20 years ago, structure and system and quality of players could overcome those things. Now, you know, we, we just saw on the weekend, Frio just ran us off our legs. Um, and so I think it's a huge, huge factor. And so, you know, I think we can make it. And I'm thinking of the dogs back in 2016. You know, everything's got to go right. Swans fall away. Um, you know, I, I think uh, where there's hope. You know, if we make the finals, of course, we've got a chance, but, you know, not a great one. Uh, next one, I don't think we need to answer because I think we've talked about it. Tank or try, I'm starting to come to terms that, oh, this is El Diablo, sorry. Tank or try, I'm starting to come to terms that even if we somehow uh, make it to the finals, we are not capable of winning uh, even one game. I think we all agree that our list needs a significant overhaul, a couple of players to retire and delist, have some cups, cap space to use, and we could get a top six pick, uh, get Gorn and track, track fit and ready for season 2025, a last dance for May, Gorn, T-Mac and Melksham. Um, we'll just leave that as a comment. Um, we have uh, a, a voicemail. I, I had switched off. Uh, while I was on holidays, I switched off my, the voicemail uh, for the Skype uh, when I turned it on again. We had received a call last week from a new unknown caller. He had a comment on last week's match. I'm just going to play it now because it's short and, and just to give him his due because he took the time to reach out to us. So here is our unknown caller. Hey, guys. Uh, first time caller here. I'm not actually on Demonland, uh, but I listen to your podcast every single week. Uh, been great. Uh, I just thought I'd ring up and say that this is the first game I actually felt quietly comfortable about all the year. Essendon game. And boy, did the boys not let me down. What a game. What a game. Boys were magnificent all night, I thought. Uh, even in the wet weather, which I didn't think would do too great in once that started coming down. Um, but they played a game out of their skins, I thought. Uh, anyway, thanks for your time. Uh, look forward to the podcast. Thanks, guys. I love it. Please, go. Great. Who Please. was that, Andy? I don't know. I don't know. Call. He didn't give a name. So, okay. so uh, ne- next time, leave a name. Doesn't have to be a real one. You can make one up. Uh, <laughs> like we it's gave. It's like the Demon Land equivalent of the unknown soldier, but not quite as dramatic. Yeah. So, so the unknown I, caller, we were terrific last week. So let's not pretend we weren't. So I thought, uh, you know, he, he took the time to call uh, listeners of the show, uh, give him his juice. So that's why I played it this week. Uh, Let's talk Casey quickly. Uh, in the wet and wild conditions, uh, the Casey Demons fell to the Franks and Dolphins by 27 points at uh, Kinetic Stadium. Uh, the match was heavily influenced by strong winds and heavy rain, making clean possession difficult and affecting kicking accuracy throughout uh, Frankston's second quarter dominance, where they kicked seven goals to Casey's one, set the tone for the match. The Demons failed to capitalise on the breeze in the opening term and were unable to recover from the Dolphins' onslaught, trailing by 27 points at half time. Casey was already facing an uphill battle with only five AFL-listed players uh, available, uh, including late withdrawals uh, Ben Brown and Tajwa Woden, which left them one player short on the bench. Uh, This disadvantage was significant, especially given the taxing conditions underfoot. Despite the tough circumstances, several Casey players stood out. Uh, Melbourne rookie Kynan Brown was exceptional, recording 27 disposals and an incredible 24 tackles. Uh, 11 clearances and a goal. Uh, his fearless approach and high work rate were highlights in the muddy and blustery conditions. Mitch White displayed strong leadership by amassing, amassing 24 disposals and 13 tackles. Jack Bell was was a key target up forward, scoring two goals. Uh, Ronan Steele played his 50th VFL match uh, and uh, racked up 23 disposals. And um, in defence, Blake Howes and Marty Hoare each finished with 21 disposals, working tirelessly to stem the flow of Frankston's attack. Uh, attacks. Uh, Josh Shackey also made a notable contribution with 18 disposals in a move to defence. Despite leading by one goal a quarter time, Casey struggled with accuracy and consistency in the wet conditions. Ultimately, Frankston's second quarter blitz and the harsh weather proved too much for the Demons to overcome. Casey will look to bounce back as they face the GWS Giants next Saturday on home turf at Casey Fields. Uh, B-Man, you said you watched it. George, I'm not sure if you did. Um, yep, you did. Some quick, it was, quick observations. It was a bit, I had a flashback to watching um, Dandenong. He's like, were the Dandenong's red legs? Yep. 
Yeah, I, I used to like Dan Inong and that's what I had a flashback, sort of Frankston Dan Inong on a Sunday afternoon watching the VFL and that's what it felt like. I didn't recognise any of the names except for a handful and didn't recognise any of Frankston's name and it's a stupid ground, that kinetic stupid name. It's like a tram track. <laughs> it's, uh, it wasn't much of a game to... to um, Really, it was a pretty average game. It was raining pretty heavily, though, for almost all of it, or a big chunk well, of it. First, first half was a screaming, screaming wind. Yeah, there was and wind. The, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were kicking goals from the centre square. Yeah, or, or Frankston were, and um, yeah, we didn't. Casey didn't do much in the first quarter, which killed them in the end. And, and then, it really and hard then, to take and, anything out of it, really. And, from and then, it, then it belted down completely in the third quarter, and then the last quarter was fine. <laughs> Lovely weather. <laughs> Which ridiculous. is when they kicked away. So yeah. <laughs> weather. Yeah. Like, um, there were, to be honest, nothing jumped out from a Melbourne perspective. Um, Fullerton didn't have a game where um, he didn't know. Didn't he didn't play. play. No, didn't, I was going to say didn't, didn't see the whole match, so that's probably why. Um, so, yeah, there were, I don't know, did you anything jump out for you positive-wise, George, in that match? Uh, the only po- real positives, I thought, <coughs> um, were Marty Hall. In the back yeah, line, who yeah. did, did a great job. Um, he reads the play so beautifully. Um, it's a pity we haven't got a, a place for him, although with with uh, Salem probably not coming up next week, we might be able to find find it's a hole for him. Injured, he? Well, he did a hamstring. He didn't play the last quarter. Oh, right, okay. Didn't that happen. hamstring tight, tightness was what was uh, listed in the yeah. natural report. Yeah, so of, of the Casey ones, um, yeah, Hall was fantastic. Really, really disappointed in Adams. Uh, barely, barely got a touch of the ball, uh, considering how long, how often the ball was coming into the back line. Um, the um, Kine and Brown was fantastic, but again, it's it's really hard to take what, big on numbers. But it was so wet and so horrible on the in the middle. You should be able to get twenty seven tackles. Maybe we should use him in our forward line for someone who can um, who will tackle the opposition, because the ball was just constantly in in a contested. After contest, after contests, and so yeah, it wasn't surprising. The trouble is, you wouldn't dare put him in an AFL midfield because he'll get smashed. Um, he'll be broken in two. He just hasn't got the body to be able to do that. Um, Jefferson for me was also very, very, very disappointing. Um, Mr. Sitter, he, he, I was just about to say him. Jefferson didn't. Then I thought to myself, I'll bet he didn't play so uh, No, he, <laughs> he did play. He yeah. missed, missed an absolute sitter, which he should have gotten. And, you know, there's plenty of people do that. He, he just doesn't look fit. Well, it's he the just thing, doesn't, he it's just the doesn't run. It was the same issue yeah. with Wiedemann. Yeah. Is that they, he was better a few weeks ago, uh, but it, it just the problem for me, it, so he's not yet at AFL Fitness, so there's that. Yeah. But for me, like my number one thing on football is about whether they're ready for the AFL or the next step is whether that second effort and third effort is instinctive. Yeah. Like it happens before... You know that, like you know, that's. I remember you and I talking on the pod with Andy with JVR. It's like it was so obvious that the kid wanted the footy, like, yeah. uh, and that's not with the same with Jefferson, is it? No, and he's um, he's really slow off the mark, which which will kill you in AFL um, at AFL level. Um, you've you've got to be able to almost sprint being a forward to, to gain that metre uh, needed to be able to uh, get rid of your defender. And Jefferson's uh, good overhead mark. He doesn't jump is the other problem that I've got with him. Um, he has got a long, long way before he, he develops to an AFL standard. Um, people just look at the name on the list and the fact that he's playing forward and say, well, look, he's kicking all these goals. But as Ben Man said before, the difference between VFL and AFL is absolutely chalk and cheese. You should be kicking, as, as JVR was in his first year. You should be kicking thirty and forty goals if you um, if you're any, if you're serious about taking that next step. Jeffo needs to be able to do that. And just on that, George, it's interesting this season because it's streamed on the um, AFL app. Uh, Commentary is variable. <laughs> that's that's one thing. But I've watched a bit more uh, VFL footy than I have in previous years, and like you've watched more of it than me in the last few years. Uh, Am I right to say that the standards dropped off a fair bit in the last five years or so, or is oh, that it, no? It's it's really dramatic, really dramatically dropped off, particularly when they've got these, they've got the non-affiliated sides, you know, the Frankstons, you know, um, 
uh, Northern Bull Lance, those sort of players, Coburg, like, and, uh, Coburg, and then they're throwing in the you know Southport's a very strong club, but they're throwing all these second rate um, clubs into the competition, and it's just it is really second and probably third rate. Um, the AFL sides that are affiliated, uh, like this this round, you know, we had five players available. So you're filling it. You're filling it up with not just Casey, know, Casey yeah, affiliated yeah, players. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You know, Frankston, YCW are putting players on the ground. Yeah, you know, that sort of uh, standards. And then you don't get any cohesion with, amongst the no. team because you've got players that probably never played with each other or trained with each other. So, yeah. which goes, we've talked about how in previous years when Kate, when fit, I mean, it goes to the injuries as well, but. Ha- having your second team mirror all of your setups and structures that your first team play, but you can't do that. For instance, if you don't have a ruck who m- can mimic the dominance of Max, for instance, or you, you know, so there's that that challenge. But just on that sort of the bigger point, though, I think is that this idea of depth is a you know where wherever you land on Melbourne's depth, every club struggle, struggles with depth. Swans, if they lose two or three players and they look like they're going to lose a couple from the weekend, if they lose three or four players, they'll be back in the pack. Collingwood, for you know, they partly their their challenge is they've they've lost three or four of their best players. Like it's just, and, and I really worry about when the Tasmanian team comes in because there's just not that. <laughs> and there's just not enough elite runners who can also play footy for this many teams. I don't reckon. Yeah. I can just see us bottoming out at that time and then uh, being screwed on draft picks. Uh, <laughs> but I can hear you. So I can hear it now. Is oh no, we're with the deepens and we're going to be beaten by the devils. Like you oh, know, how 100%. terrible are we? Uh, how, how dare they name them the devils? All right, let's get on to the injury list. We had one casualty from Sunday's match against the Dockers with Christian Saylor, Salem pr- reportedly pulling up with a tight hamstring. So watch this space. Uh, we'll see what happens there. But all eyes will be firmly on the fitness of Captain Max Gorn, who last week was close to overcoming that uh, crack in his ankle. Um, uh, so, boys, so let's get into changes. So if Max is available this week, uh, who's coming in? Who's going out? Uh, Big man followed by George. <laughs> Well, last week I accurately predicted uh, no one would come out. Um, so um, who will come in? Well, Maxie's got to come back, doesn't he? Well, if he's fit. How um, close was he, he last week? Well, it depends who. He, he, he wanted to play apparently is yeah. what um, mm. I've heard. Like he was dead keen to play and um, – I'm sort of glad they didn't because uh, I don't think it would have made much difference. So it's not, you know, not uh, well, like one player's not going to make a difference anyway, but not with that lack of spread. If we can't cover those out- outlets and their spread, it doesn't matter if Maxi played. So, a benefit at least, he's had two legs, two weeks off legs, I guess. Or so, he, you know, he'll come back surely. <clears throat> it sort of goes to this 33% and <laughs> jumping to 44% if we win. And he's so, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I, I hope he certainly plays. And, um, and who comes out, I guess you work backwards from um, Billings and, um, yeah. you know, I think Billings, I thought Billings was pretty good actually, so he might keep his spot. Um, but Maxi in, I don't know who, who comes out for Maxi. Oh, uh, Salem. Well, it all depends on what. Oh, that, he's definitely out, is he? Well, we don't oh, know. He's oh, just oh. tightness. So oh, it depends. Yeah, I'd, I'd say, he's out for, <laughs> say he's out for a week and probably more, probably four to six. <laughs> four to six. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying Maxi in. I'm not saying who's coming out. All right. George, any any thoughts? No, not not really beyond that. I don't yeah. think we've got a handle on, you know, it's going to be one of the fringe players come in or out, the Billings, the Woden, the Laurie, the um, Kine and Brown, One pick one, anyone. Yeah. One thing, though, about Maxi, like this week is another challenge because it's Biggs, isn't it? Is it Biggs or Briggs? Briggs. He's a he's a, he's a pretty formidable looking young fellow in terms of his ruck work and yeah he's um, he's Mumford Mark too yeah so he you know Maxi um, we need you come back if you're listening Maxi I don't care how bad <laughs> your, he's your ankle is <laughs> he's not listening uh, are you his sponsor can you tell him to start listening yeah uh, I can, I can. And, 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 anyway. and, and and Petty and JVR are sending the same message <laughs> yeah, they are they the time. Are. <laughs> Um, uh, the especially de- JVR, I reckon. The demons are hanging on by a thread to remain in contention for finals with a tough five weeks ahead. We might be only one game and percentage out of the eight, but we can't really afford to drop many or any 
games in the next month and change if we want to challenge for September. Uh, most, if not all, uh, of our next few games are eight-point games against other contenders, as this very well could be our last roll of the dice. Uh, Demon WA says, Andy, you should have remained on holiday. Uh, no, <laughs> believe me, I would have if I could afford it. Uh, in all seriousness, though, that was a game that no one's uh, ladder predictor would have had us winning. A win next week against the hot and cold Giants, uh, and we're back on track. Yes, uh, a win could get us back on track. George, uh, followed by Biman, how, how are we going to right the ship that was almost sunk by the Dockers? <laughs> uh don't don't create turnovers against the Giants because they will absolutely thread us the same as uh, Fremantle did. That's 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 a big thing. I uh, I've still got big questions about the fitness levels and whether we can sustain it. The Giants are absolutely packed with uh, players who are skillful. Um, like the weather reports actually showing some rain uh, on the horizon, which might be the biggest thing in our favour. Um, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we were dreading any rain. <laughs> yeah, now it's yeah, like bring yeah, it on. Yeah, we we seem to have learned how to play wet weather football <laughs> um, uh, in the in recent weeks. Uh, it's a pity we couldn't do it earlier or in previous years. But um, yeah, the Giants are uh, a really big threat. Uh, they've they've just got so much talent there. That's really scary. Um, trouble is they don't bring it every week and let's hope they don't this week not a million miles away from that uh, frio's game in fact the giants they've got a similar um sort of they i mean all teams like pressure all teams like being forward half you you win but um you know you win lots of games of footy if you obviously you get you know you win that forward half game if you can but they're ranked number one in the afl for handballs per game so they like Frio like um, bombers. They like to get that ball moving forward with handball, and I think that's that's what we've been trying to implement too. Sort of not as successfully as those teams, and they're ranked two for disposals per game. Um, so, you know, and I think that's behind uh, Frio uh, in terms of they. So they like to use chain out, similar to um, the way the bombers and Frio like to do. To um, you know. They move it not quite as – they don't use the width. They're much more straight line footy, but they, they certainly look to go fast off that halfback flank. But they've also balanced that by, you know, they're, they're third in the AFL for tackles per game. So, you know, they, they really, I think, um, they like the contest and it'll be one and lost in the contest. I think really every game we go into, if our pressure's not up there and, you know, we're not winning the contested ball, um, then we're not going to win. So it will really come down t- to our ability to get to that pressure level and contest level that we um, showed, you know, uh, at times last week. So uh, in the game against Frio, but certainly against the Bombers. Um, and, you know, a bit will depend on, um, you know, our ability to shut some of their, their sort of key players who, um, you know, who've been, they've been sort of on an upper swing too. They've, you know, it's also good to remember that they lost four out of five games just a few weeks ago, the Giants. So, you know, it, as I've been at pains to point out, all teams have had their periods of struggle. Um, they've got a pretty good record against us at the G, I think. You know, there was a game they – What do you know what their record at the G? Well, Did you they, mention that before? They beat us. I didn't, but they beat us in uh, in our premiership season there. Um, uh, we thumped them the next year, I believe. Uh, it, it was early in the year. But, um, yeah, they have beaten us a couple of times there. But What um, – I would say is what I said ahead of the North game is uh, get along. You know, we had a 30,000 plus against the Roos and I thought it was a big factor. Um, and so it would be great if Melbourne fans turn up for what is a really, really must win game. How many more games have we got at home this year? Uh, good question. We'll uh, play Collingwood. Four. I'm sure it's there. Uh, yeah. Uh, is that Bulldogs our home is game? A, Bulldogs is a marvel, I know. And, yeah. Uh, Gold Coast is in Gold Coast. Yeah. And then Collingwood's at home. Yeah. So we're only two more home games for the season. So, yeah, let's, every Demon fan who can get along, go bananas, um, and, you know, let's turn that 33%, one in three <laughs> chance of making the finals to basically 50-50 chance of making the finals. Yep, let's do that. <laughs> uh, well, we're going to leave it there for tonight. We'll be back next week. If you want to listen to the show live, uh, please head on over to demonland.com on Monday night at a new earlier time of 7.30 p.m. Thank you to our five-star reviewer on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to Penny Dropper. Thank you 
Uh, to our voicemailers, Rose Star Salty and our unknown caller. Um, your questions and comments uh, form an integral part of the show. So thank you to our Demonland posters who submitted questions and comments. Thank you to the Pearl, Magnus, Sam6172, the Taciturn Demon, Swooper, Northy, uh, Monocular, um, uh, Lazy, Logues, Gaundy the Great, Spirit of Norm Smith, um, Clintosaurus, Buck Naked, Travi14, Track, Forever, Doug Reamer, Oh My D's, Gibroni, El Diablo 14, Fire in the Benelli, and Demon WA. Thank you to my co-hosts, uh, George and B-Man, and thank you to you, our loyal listeners. Don't forget, leave us a five-star review and a comment on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. So we'll read it out on next week's show. Go, Demons. Go, Red Leggers. Come on, Demons. Come on, Demons.